Okay, um, so with that, why don't we get started, Caitlin? Sure. Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us um, to talk about community wildfire resiliency in areas A and C. Um, my name is Caitlin Fader. I'm the Emergency Planning Coordinator for the Regional District of Nanaimo, and I'm the project manager on the Regional District side. Um, uh, and I've been working with Matt Shields from Diamond Head Consulting. Um, he is our, our lead on this project to write these community wildfire resiliency plans for the regional district. Um, so we hope that all of you um, get something from this meeting. Um, our game plan is to have a presentation that Matt's going to describe CWRPs and, and also kind of describe some of the things that might go into it and what you might expect to see. And uh, then we'll also have a question and answer period. So you're more than welcome to uh, raise your hand and ask a question. Um, and we can always have a little bit of a discussion about it. So with that, Matt, you may take it away. Great. Um, can anyone, everyone see my screen okay? We're seeing a slide presentation, right? Okay, perfect. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us and thanks for that introduction, Caitlin. Um, so as Caitlin explained, this webinar is part of a series of events, uh, online events that explains the regional district of Nanaimo's preparation of the new community wildfire resiliency plans. Um, just before we uh, launch into the presentation here, I just wanted to acknowledge that the project takes place on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Snenemos, Danas, Qualcomm, and Relations. And I, uh, I'm i joining from the traditional uh, territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, in Vancouver tonight. Um, right, so first I'm gonna give you a brief refresher uh, if you didn't catch our earlier event in August about what a community wildfire resiliency plan even is. Um, then I'm gonna talk about our findings on fire risk uh, in your community, electoral areas A and C. And then finally, uh, we'll have a little section where we can talk about some of the things that the regional district might be able to do to support fire smart in your community uh, and reduce wildfire risk. Uh, and I'm thinking the presentational, it should take about 25 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll have the rest of the hour um, to take and answer questions and just sort of have a discussion about um, what you'd like to know about wildfire risk and. Uh, any questions you have for us? So, right, what is a community, community wildfire resiliency plan anyways? So CWRPs for short are adopted by local government. They map wildfire risk around communities and they propose recommendations to reduce that wildfire risk. Um, the plans are paid for through provincial government grants, and what you get at the end is a high-level strategy for managing wildfire risk in your community, and it looks a little like this. This is a plan that uh, the company I work for, Diamond Head, I recently completed for the Sunshine Coast Regional District just across the water for you, from you guys. Um, so we'll be preparing one of these plans uh, for each electoral area A and electoral area C. You guys are lumped together for the online presentation, but you won't be lumped together for the document. You'll each have your own. Um, and the plans are meant to be read uh, by you, by the public, as well as policymakers, um, so that you can help uh, build awareness uh, of wildfire risk in your area, in your neighborhood, and understand some of the context of the local landscape, community values, and historic recognitions. Um, so uh, the plans provide strategic advice on how the regional district can manage wildfire risk. Uh, in the latter part of this presentation, as I mentioned, we'll talk more about what kinds of recommendations the plan will make. Um, in some ways, what goes into these documents is also guided by the provincial government who oversees wildfire fighting in the province. For example, while wildfire risk is present throughout um, uh, uh, forested areas like your communities, only public lands uh, can be analyzed by our project for wildfire risk. So when you see the maps in a couple slides, don't be surprised by the large areas uh, of private land that don't appear, um, just as a caveat. What you can think of is the plan is a first step towards building a fire smart community. It leaves lots of room for the regional district to tailor risk management to local circumstances, and it acts as a key to further provincial funding for more detailed activities. So what does our process to make these look like? So it starts with a review of your community's context, its weather, its fire history, 
uh, its environment, its cultural values. Um, and then uh, we conduct site visits uh, around electoral area A and electoral area C. These were completed in July and August uh, when we visited uh, public parks and other lands uh, to assess potential wildfire behavior. Um, then we move on to an analysis phase with all that data that we collected. We do some mapping work to understand what wildfire risk actually is based on kinds of forests you have in your community. And then the last part is those recommendations. And those are themed around what are called the seven fire smart disciplines, which I'll talk about more later. So we're at the point where we're still developing recommendations. So again, uh, I'm just throwing in a little advertisement for the Q&A, but if you have any thoughts, questions, or suggestions, please feel free to share them uh, when we're finished the presentation here in a moment. So um, let's start with that background. So I don't have time to go through all the material that will be in the plans, uh, but it includes population and area statistics, growth trends in your communities, um, where your parks are, uh, the kind of environment and natural features that are there, uh, your climate and weather is mentioned. And you, if you showed up to this uh, event, you already know uh, what your community looks like. Um, but electoral areas A and C, uh, you know, they are forest communities. They contain a diversity uh, of landscapes from small towns like Cedar, nestled in farmland and mixed forest, to new subdivisions above the Nanaimo Parkway on the side of Mount Benson. And one similarity between all of these places is that they include a lot of forest on public and private land. So the, the map at the top right here is showing the extent of private land in electoral area A and electoral area C. Um, as you can see, it is quite a lot. Uh, public land in these electoral areas is highly fragmented because of historic land grants during the colonial period. Um, this is different from many communities in British Columbia, most of which are surrounded by mostly public land administered by the Crown. Um, this is important for our project because it influences how we respond to wildfire risk and also under the funding terms for the Community Wildfire Resiliency Planning, data for privately owned areas is withheld for privacy concerns, um, which affects the maps as I discussed earlier. So one piece of the background that I would like to bring to your attention is the recent fire history of this area. So we know that fire is part of the ecological history of most coniferous forests in North America. Before colonial settlement, large natural fires may have occurred as frequently as once every 150 to 200 years in our area. Fire was also used extensively by indigenous people along the coast to create open meadows for root crops like camas and game forage. These fires mostly would have been smaller controlled burns lit during the shoulder of the fire season. Pre-colonial fire history is an area of active research. For our project, we looked more closely at data maintained by the BC Wildfire Service, which is what this map is showing you. Um, so the map shows two different pieces of information, both from that provincial uh, database maintained by the wildfire service. And so the first thing I want you to look at is those red dots. So think of each point as an individual fire start or ignition that was reported to the wildfire service. Some of these fire starts grew to become wildfires, while many didn't uh, because of unfavorable weather conditions or because they were actively fought. Um, every ignition in the province's data between 1950 and 2020 is shown, which totals over 1,200 fire starts. Then the second piece of information uh, is the polygons, the blobs. So those shapes on the map represent the recorded perimeters or areas of historic wildfires. And this data is shown between the years 1919 and 2020, so a full 100 years. The lighter the color, the further in the past uh, did the wildfire occur and 123 uh, fires um, are mapped in that, in that data set. And what you can see is that most of the large wildfires in electoral area A, just talking about electoral area A right now, um, occurred before 1950. So those are the lighter colors. However, there's still been lots of ignitions, the red points in recent decades. Um, remember that every dot occurred after 1950 because the data sets are from different time periods. Even historic fires are fairly small um, perhaps due to the long history of agriculture in communities like Cedar and Cassidy, which breaks up the forest landscape and existed long before 1920. So in electoral area C, the story is a bit different. Um, while most of the large forest fires still occurred in the early 20th century, those lighter colors, there have been significant fires on occasion up to the present. For example, the Nanaimo Lakes fire in 2018, which I'm sure many of you know about. Um, 
However, the area burned in both electoral areas has decreased drastically since the early 20th century. So now fires are on average much smaller. Uh, and this is in part um, because there's more landscape fragmentation and also more effective fire suppression. So you might also be noticing that there are more red points or those fire starts and ignitions near populated areas. They're all concentrated towards the east uh, where um, the communities actually are. And this reflects that most of the ignitions in uh, electoral areas A and C are human caused. So this chart uh, is showing you the breakdown of ignitions by cause, person, or lightning. Um, so orange, the person caused fires, outstrip lightning caused fires in every time period since 1950. And the difference is actually uh, one of about 10 times. And this is because our region doesn't really receive a lot of lightning during the fire season. Um, and that is uh, just something uh, that helps us uh, understand the risk environment in our communities. Okay, so scratch that, new map. <laughs> uh, now the red dots are not fire starts. They're actually showing you where we went in electoral areas A and C for our site visits. Um, so again, notice that most of the sites we visited are in the east near Island Highway. Why? And there's one simple answer, and that's the Wildland Urban Interface. And if you haven't heard of the Wildland Urban Interface, um, it's this orange area, the orange bounded area on the map where you can still see the satellite imagery. Um, so this is an area selected by the province that forms a buffer around areas of higher population. And the Wildland Urban Interface is really important for controlling fire risk because firstly, it's where most people live and most infrastructure is located. Secondly, it's where homes directly meet, meet forest vegetation. And thirdly, it's where there are the most sources of ignition, uh, particularly in a landscape dominated by human caused fires, as we talked about earlier. So our site visits had a couple of purposes. The first was to visit forests in the vicinity of homes and communities and make wildfire threat assessments. And I'll explain what a wildfire threat assessment is in just a second. Um, the second was to visit pieces of infrastructure that could be important for emergency response, like fire halls, uh, water infrastructure, or communications towers. And the third was just to see a wide variety of areas to better understand the form of development uh, in different parts of the regional district. So let's talk more about these wildfire threat assessments um, because these are what help us develop uh, updated maps of wildfire risk. So the wildfire threat assessment process. Um, this is the backbone of the community wildfire resiliency plan. Um, so the threat assessments uh, were done during July and August, as I say, and wildfire threat in wildfire threat assessments refers to the biophysical potential of a forest to ignite and support fire. And what I mean by that is sort of the flammability of the forest, the um, condition of the trees and vegetation that enable the fire to take place. Um, and wildfire threat combines these three elements. It combines forest fuels, weather during the fire season, and topography, um, because these are the primary factors that control natural fire behavior. Wildfire threat is rated for different forests as very low, low, moderate, high and extreme. And like I said, you can think of wildfire threat as being somewhat like a rating of flammability. The threat ratings don't specifically take into account the likelihood of ignition though. All forests from low to extreme require a spark before they burn. Um, because we get our topography and weather data from the province, our field assessments focus on forest fuels. And you might be wondering what are forest fuels? Well, when we talk about fuels in a forestry context, we're simply talking about the wood, branches, leaves, needles, shrubs, uh, ground cover, organic soils, um, and all the other forms of biomass that can catch on fire and burn during a wildfire. So I missed my slides. <laughs> wildfire threat is those three elements. Um, there are several uh, traits we use to characterize forest fuels. And don't worry about writing these down um, because I'm just going to run through them pretty quickly. When making our threat assessments, we look at each of these common terms in our forest fuels glossary. These traits 
tend to vary at the scale of a forest stand, an area of similar forest cover usually sharing a historic disturbance. So concepts like surface fuel, ladder fuel, and crown fuel describe the different parts of a forest and how they behave during a wildfire. While measures of density, like stems per hectare, can be used to assess overall volumes of living, dead, or even fallen trees. Tree species, of course, influence fuel characteristics because coniferous trees are broadly more active during wildfires than deciduous trees. And then the most important concept for us to understand is the fuel type, this one down at the end of the list. And fuel types essentially are all of the other characteristics thrown together. So a fuel type is a representation of a pattern in a forest of these other characteristics. So fuel types come to us from the Canadian Forest Service uh, which conducts applied research to determine how well the different forests of Canada support wildfire. And in British Columbia, the BC Wildfire Service has adapted this system to describe BC's great diversity of forests. So as you probably know, around your communities, there are a lot of uh, different types of forests. Um, coniferous fuel types tend to have a moderate to extreme wildfire threat. They tend to be more active than forests that have more deciduous trees, those broadleaf trees like maples and alder. So on the coast of British Columbia, the standard practice has been to assign most coniferous forests, but not all, most forests to what's called the C5 fuel type. And this map is showing you uh, the different fuel types uh, within electoral areas A and the wooey portion of electoral area C. And of course, as I mentioned previously, the blackout areas are private land. So C5s are shown in this sort of peachy orange color on the map. So anytime you see a peach or orange color, that's somewhere that we found a mostly coniferous forest uh, that resembled that fuel type. Um, and you can see they're the most common fuel type on the map as a whole. Um, they're definitely the most common in electoral area C, and they're the second most common fuel type in electoral area A. So these are forests that you would know from Mount Benson, uh, Hemmer Provincial Park, Roberts Provincial Park, and they look something like that. Um, they're often, you know, mature, older stands uh, of Douglas fir, Western Red Cedar, sometimes Western Hemlock. Um, and uh, basically those conifers are the only trees around. Uh, to have a C5 forest, you have to have more than 75% of the entire forest be just coniferous. So in terms of the fuel type characteristics that we brushed over, um, so what does this fuel type look like? So it has low to moderate uh, density of trees. It has a good fuel strata gap. Um, so that's the distance between all the stuff on the ground, the shrubs, the logs, the dead branches and needles, and the crowns, which are the upper parts of the tree. Uh, it has a low to moderate density of surface and ladder fuels. So surface fuels are those, again, the fuels on the ground, while the ladder fuels are some of these smaller young trees that are shooting up underneath the main canopy. Um, so conversely, the other main fuel type in your area, those deciduous and mixed wood fuels, which is shown in the purple on the map, um, these fuels are, uh, you know, they have 25 to almost 100% composition of deciduous trees, which typically help to subdue wildfire behavior. Um, wildfire threat does vary in these fuel types a lot, uh, but it usually varies in proportion with the number of conifer trees that are present. So the photo shows deciduous fuel uh, in the vicinity of Morden Colliery, a place that some of you might have been for walks or things like that. So these deciduous forests, they're full of trees like big leaf maple, red alder. Um, you know, they lose their leaves in the winter and during the summer fire season, uh, they are typically less flammable because the trees themselves have higher moisture content um, and uh, some characteristics that uh, help subdue fire. Okay, so <laughs> fuel types often correlate but do not perfectly predict uh, the kind of fire behavior that we'd expect because of the variability in forest that we see on the landscape. So fire rank is a visual classification used by the BC Wildfire Service to help illustrate the kinds of fires that can occur. So the higher the fire rank, moving to the right on the slide, the less predictable, the faster it spreads, and the more dangerous is the wildfire. 
beyond rank three in the middle there, fires are often too difficult to directly fight with ground crews and must be extinguished by air support or favorable weather. So the likelihood of higher rank fires tends to increase with more flammable fuel types and more extreme fire weather, i.e. extended drought, hot weather, and high winds. So one way of thinking about this is that it's easier for an area of high or extreme wildfire threat to sustain a fire of higher rank than for a moderate threat rated area. So active crown fires are those where fire is spreading directly between tree crowns, like you can see on the right of this image. So these are fires that can send large numbers of embers long distances, burn with high intensity, and are major threats to nearby communities. Um, but fire, of course, of any rank in the interface where homes and values are, is capable uh, of being a public safety threat. So the wildland urban interface is where wildfire threat becomes wildfire risk. So risk is when there is something of value that could burn down because of a wildfire. And fires have three ways of spreading from forests into communities. So the first is direct flame. So that's when a wildfire burning in a forest behind a home is able to come right up to the home uh, because there's vegetation that's continuous between the forest and the building itself. The second way is radiant heat. So fire fronts can generate a lot of energy. So even if your home does not directly touch forest vegetation, if it's within 10 or sometimes as many as 30 meters of a forest that's on fire, the heat from the blaze can be enough to cause materials on the home to ignite. So the greatest risk of this happening is within 10 meters though. And third, ember ignition. So a fire, like I mentioned, can send off embers or firebrands that ignite flammable materials well in advance of the fire's arrival. So embers can lodge in crevices in your roof or siding or ignite landscaping near your home. Um, embers can also travel up to several kilometers, though a few hundred meters is more typical. So with all that background, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the wildfire risk that we modeled uh, around your community. So before I dive into these slides, I've split up uh, the areas in three. So first we're going to look at electoral area A, uh, and then we'll look at uh, electoral area C in two parts, a southern part for extension and then a northern part around East Wellington. Um, so just to orient yourself to the map, so the black, of course, is private land, as we talked about earlier. Um, the light green and blue colors are very low wildfire risk. The light yellow is low. That sort of general yellow color, the neon yellow, is moderate. Orange is high and red is extreme. So um, as you can see, almost all the areas of public land, which are where we've actually shown the wildfire risk in electoral area A are moderate. So the very low areas down here, over here, and this way, they're all uh, typically either water, so the ocean, uh, or sometimes lakes in uh, yet towards Yellow Point, um, or their non-fuel. So areas like the Nanaimo Airport, which just has extensive uh, tarmac where there's just no vegetation in sight. And then there are very small areas of high wildfire risk, which you can sort of see along that edge, and then here, sort of scattered around that orange color. And those areas are typically associated with those conifer fuel types on steeper slopes. So moving over to extension, again, almost all the areas of public land uh, have moderate wildfire risk. So the very low areas, again, are generally either water or areas of no fuel, like at the Nanaimo Water Treatment Plant, where there's, again, an extensive area of uh, pavement. And then similarly, there are very small areas of high wildfire risk, uh, which are, again, associated with the steeper slope areas. And then lastly, up in East Wellington, this map is a little bit different, as you can tell. Um, a significant amount of public land in East Wellington has high wildfire risk due to coniferous fuel types on very steep slopes. Um, what you're looking at here, this is uh, sort of the area around Benson uh, Regional Park. Um, so the parking lot would be right around here. There's Witchcraft Lake. Um, and then continuing off uh, outside of the parklands into the VIU woodlot. Um, 
However, despite this high wildfire risk ranking, I want to underscore um, that the fuel characteristics are different. They change throughout this whole area. So the fuel components of the threat assessment in Mount Benson Park, for example, they actually scored low. If you just look at, if you don't look at topography and the weather, if you just look at the forest fuels, I went to this location by Witchcraft Lake and in here, the fuel component uh, suggests low threat. But when you model that with the steep, steep slopes that you find on the side of Mount Benson, it comes out as high wildfire risk. So just to sum up sort of the themes from the wildfire risk analysis. So moderate risk is typical throughout Cedar, Cassidy, Extension, and East Wellington on public land. What does that mean? So moderate risk essentially means that many people are living in communities where wildfire is possible, though by no means certain, uh, during extreme wildfire, extreme fire weather conditions. So during those uh, long, hot summers uh, uh, with, with long periods of dry weather. Um, secondly, so private land severely fragments the forest landscape, making it difficult to gain a complete picture of the risk environment. That said, uh, we know that areas west of Island Highway are typically more exposed to large contiguous areas of coniferous forest. And then thirdly, areas of higher risk are generally related to steep slopes. Um, so in these areas, uh, because the fuel types are mostly consistent, um, What's driving high risk versus moderate risk is typically wherever you start to see steep, steep mountains or hilly terrain. And in these hilly areas, there may be limited potential to manage fuels because of the low feasibility and or actually low fuel volumes in some cases. Okay, um, I know that was a bit of a long haul. So now that I filled uh, your head with all that risk analysis, let's talk about what we could do to prepare. So the CWRP will make recommendations for the RDN to manage wildfire risk in each electoral area. So the recommendations are gonna follow the seven disciplines of fire smart. Uh, here they are, education, community planning, development considerations, uh, and the like. Um, I pulled out some high level ideas in this section of the presentation that we're considering for the plans in your area. And I've split them roughly into education, community planning and development, emergency response and fuel management topics. Um, so most of these actions I think we should mention are eligible for additional money from the province if they're supported by these plans. So education, what's it about? So public education and outreach play a critical role in helping communities prepare for wildfire by promoting a sense of empowerment and shared responsibility. Recommendations in this section will focus on what the regional district can do to improve awareness of wildfire in the community and increase resources and participation in FireSmart by members of the public. For example, the regional district could work uh, with its parks department to install wildfire awareness signage or educational material in popular park locations like Mount Benson or Morton Colliery. Um, popular recreational areas are high traffic, high visibility locations where people are already going to think about forests. So this is a good opportunity to connect the dots between forests and fire. Um, the regional district can also act as a conduit for fire smart educational and promotional materials in the community, helping local fire departments, other organizations or individuals access this material. Um, the regional district could also support community days for wildfire preparedness, typically focused on cleanup of a park or public facility um, or knowledge sharing at public events like farmers markets. The regional district could also support individual neighborhood associations in accessing these materials uh, and achieving recognition of their own fire smart achievements. Neighborhoods that might make sense to support fire smart neighborhood committees in could be extension in the Mount Benson area, but these initiatives often need uh, willing support and initiation from local neighbors to ensure their success. So community planning and development recommendations will address how the RDN conducts its own business, including park and infrastructure management. Uh, and these recommendations could uh, potentially be expanded into new guidance um, for land acquisition. Like when the regional district acquires a new park property, um, do they do things to assess the wildfire threat or risk? Oops. Um, so 
for example, uh, the regional district may consider uh, adopting internal policies to make sure that parks, regional district properties, and new buildings are being constructed and maintained with fire smart materials or other landscaping. Um, we can also access additional money to conduct fire smart assessments of all of our critical infrastructure. Um, this would go beyond the notes that we prepared for this CWRP uh, in order to determine which of these sites might make sense to do uh, things like hazard mitigation around, i.e. removing conifers from the sides of a fire hall. Uh, the regional district can also schedule regular fire hazard assessments of existing properties, uh, prioritizing large forested parks adjacent to homes. Um, and regarding external stakeholder relationships, uh, the regional district could add fire smart information to all development permit application packages that are going out in an area. So if you wanted to build a new home, you go to the regional district's website uh, for the development permit application, and that when you download it, it comes with a bunch of information about how to fire smart your home and what materials might make sense in your area. Okay, uh, in enhancing emergency response. So recommendations in this topic area will address how the regional district connects wildfire risk into its internal emergency preparedness and work uh, with a broad range of community actors, including independent fire departments, First Nations, and the BC Wildfire Service to train jointly and enhance uh, the response. So the regional district can lead the update of emergency and evacuation plans, ensuring that each are adequate for community size. And internal policy can promote review of emergency plans when new large developments take place. The regional district could continue to liaise with local fire departments on their needs. During this project, we heard that departments are interested in additional training opportunities which may be available through the Fire Smart program. Our volunteer uh, fire departments are working hard to protect our communities every day, uh, and they're looking for uh, ways to improve their ability to respond to a wildfire. The regional district can also support uh, multi-agency fire preparedness or planning tables. So that's getting together a bunch of firefighters from different regions or the BC Wildfire Service in a room, um, along with people who know about infrastructure, how uh, you know the water and sewer systems work, uh, bringing them all together uh, to make sure that everybody understands during a wildfire emergency whose role is what and um, what needs to happen throughout uh, the entire administration. So specifically, uh, there could be regular group meetings uh, before the fire season where fire service personnel from the province uh, and local emergency responders in the regional district uh, could discuss common issues uh, and potentially plan joint training sessions. <clears throat> and then the last topic area is fuel management. And this area addresses uh, where uh, in some locations on public land, it might make sense to actually um, pursue. So fuel management is when a professional forester makes detailed site assessments of uh, the fuel characteristics of a forest in an area. And that forester then develops a prescription, i.e. a plan, to reduce components of the forest that are creating the risk. And these assessments are more detailed and intensive than the data collected for this community wildfire resiliency plan. Uh, and they can be used to model fire behavior and intensity at specific sites. So the photos in this slide, they actually show a post-treatment uh, uh, location in similar Douglas fir and Grand fir forests, like the ones that uh, we see in some parts of our areas, in electoral areas A and C. The point being that in most cases, the purpose of fuel management is to keep a forest in place, not clear cut it. Um, it's critical to understand that fuel management typically targets smaller or dead trees, not large healthy ones. Fuel management is a tool that we can use in some situations to reduce the likelihood of fire spreading towards homes and improve the chances of suppression success. The CWRP um, will identify potential treatment areas um, on the basis of their wildfire risk rating, uh, the site assessments that we conducted, their proximity to homes, uh, and feasibility among other, uh, among other qualities. Um, however, uh, based on our site assessments, there are fairly few opportunities for fuel management in electoral area A um, due to the fragmented public land base. Um, and likewise, in electoral area C, there are some areas of contiguous public land that contain higher threat forests, but fuel management, as we mentioned earlier, it might not be the right tool for these to reduce wildfire risk because a lot of the risk is associated with steep slopes uh, and not necessarily the fuel conditions. 
So um, it's also worth mentioning that the regional district is currently planning fuel management in the 707 community park uh, nearby on Gabriola. And in that location, high density conifer forest is contributing uh, to high wildfire threat next to homes. And you can find out more about this and similar projects on the RDN's Get Involved page where you registered for this event. The 707 Park uh, Fuel Management Project will have an upcoming public event like this one where you can learn more about this aspect of wildfire risk management. Okay, um, so just to sort of draw to a close here. Uh, so while, while this planning process is ongoing for the Community Wildfire Resiliency Plan, you can submit questions and find more information at the Get Involved page. Uh, that's getinvolvedrdn.ca and search for wildfire. Uh, in the new year, we'll be having another event to present to you the highlights of all seven CWRPs before they go to the regional board. Um, and this event we expect to be online, similar to this webinar, so you can join from the comfort of your home. And we're aiming to have the CWRPs in place by February of next year, um, when they will uh, go before the regional district board in a public meeting. So that concludes the presentation part of our event. Uh, so now we have uh, plenty of time to take any uh, of your questions or thoughts. Um, the way that this is going to work is um, I would like, uh, if you have a question, if you could use the raise hand feature, and that sort of brings you to the top of our list uh, here in the Zoom meeting. Uh, and then we'll call on you. Uh, we can have a discussion. Uh, if you have any follow-ups, we can go through that. Uh, and then we'll move to the next person. Um, yeah. So with that, uh, Caitlin, I think, did you have anything that you wanted to say? <laughs> um, no, just thank you, Matt. That was super thorough. And uh, yeah, we do want to invite uh, any questions here, but if you would also like to reach out to me directly um, and ask me a question privately or something that's a bit more specific to your circumstance, I welcome you to do that. You can see my email there. That's the best way to get in contact with me. Okay, so I have a question. Rachel. Hi, Susan. Hi, Hi Susan. Caitlin. I just met Caitlin on the phone today. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question. How do you, um, have you decided a priority area um, of all your, you've got a lot of um, areas identified in the Nanaimo Regional District. So have you identified one or two? I think Matt, you mentioned something about Mount Benson and extension. Are those considered to be like places where you might uh, wanna get the um, residents or involved faster or something? Uh, so I think we're at, we're at earlier days than that in terms of okay. uh, actually recommending specific areas to sort of focus on. Um, what I, I did mention extension and Mount Benson, uh, that was in reference to um, the idea that these might be places where uh, it would make sense to encourage neighbors to band together to sort of learn about fire smart, access fire smart information. Um, and the reason I, I simply threw them, them as examples is because those are uh, the communities in um, in these electoral areas uh, where you do have, um, you know, more or less continuous residential development right up against forest and yeah so uh we haven't recommended anything specifically for uh, a particular area we're still very much working on the recommendations and we want to hear what people have to say about the communities that they live in um but my professional opinion uh to a certain extent it makes sense maybe to start thinking about um communities that are uh you know, uh, maybe a little further away from resources and uh, closer to the forest interface. Okay, and and so is that doesn't exist now? Is that what you're saying? No, yeah. So so specifically, an, so a neighborhood fire smart committee is a group of uh, concerned citizens who organize themselves. So that actually wouldn't be a regional district initiative, um, although the regional district could certainly support a group of neighbors who wanted to do that. Um, uh, it's just one of many ways that neighborhoods can take action uh, on uh, improving fire risk in your community. But uh, ba basically, so a neighborhood fire smart association, um, a group of uh, neighbors will band together, uh, they apply um, for funding from a, a national organization called Fire Smart Canada um, to get money for assessments of each individual uh, member's homes. 
And so basically those assessments, uh, you'll have uh, someone who's qualified to talk about wildfire risk come to your home. Um, and they'll have a checklist of different things that they look at to tell you that you might be able to do, like whether it's cleaning up your rear yard or moving your wood pile further away from your house, um, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, uh, that's sort of the start of a process uh, of neighbors helping neighbors to reduce wildfire risk. And you can find more information about that. There, there will be more information about that in detail in the plans uh, itself, but you can also find more information about it by going to firesmartcanada.ca. Um, but and, you uh, said that doesn't exist now anywhere no. in Limo? Uh, so it does exist. Um, there are neighborhood associations. Uh, they, they have occurred in the past and they do exist in other electoral areas, but they don't exist currently, to my knowledge, in electoral areas A or C. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we do have a fire smart community in Spider Lake. Yes, that is true. I think there is one in Spider Lake right now. Yeah. Um, and, and there are, um, there are rumblings, there are groups of people that are getting together, but they're not quite at that stage of becoming, you know, fire smart recognized, but they are people that group together um, because they are concerned or interested in becoming fire smart communities. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, oops. Uh, so I'm going to go to Jake. Jake? James, I think is what it was. Oh, J uh, oh I'm so sorry. No um, problem. No, I just want, I, I didn't really have any questions. I just want to say thank you for putting this on. So I just oh. want to ask for my appreciation. Oh, oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, do you mind, uh, may I ask, uh, what community are you joining from? What part of the regional district? Uh, Cedar. Oh, nice. Okay, very good. I'd like to... Uh, Sharon, sorry. Sorry, Sharon, please go ahead. Uh, that was my sticky fingers. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm concerned that there has... The only advertising I saw was on the regional district page on the newspaper, yeah. and making people aware of this because I live in extension at Godfrey mm -hmm. and White Rapids Road. We're in a real forest interface area. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I really had concerns last summer when there was the fire at that part of Mike Gogo's uh, mm -hmm. tree farm that's just across the ridge from where I live because I border Starts Lake. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, um, when you mention the coniferous trees, and it's usually the smaller trees, I've got coniferous trees over 18 inches in diameter that are dying. Mm -hmm. Don't know why. I mean, mind you, there was coal mining underneath um, where we are. I'm wondering if part of it is methane coming up. But, you know, I'm wondering who can come and look at my property. Mm -hmm. And, and also, you know, I'm a widow, I have a long driveway, I have six acres of um, mainly coniferous forest between Godfrey and White Rapids Road and where um, my house is. And, mm -hmm. you know, just concerns that way that um, we keep the vegetation away from my home. Mm -hmm. but, um, it's that whole other area and I know that years and years ago there was a fire swept up all through this area up Mount Benson because there's the remain stumps burnt stumps on my property I only have 10 and a half acres but things that we have noticed in the 40 years we've been here so yeah yeah uh, so some some great questions um so you know one thing that uh could potentially be the outcome of the, this plan is a recommendation uh, that the regional district um, either directly or through the local fire department in extension or um, uh, another means hire someone called a fire smart coordinator. Um, and that person would, uh, you know, you'd be able to connect with them and they could come out to your home and do that, that risk assessment. And they'd be able to, um, you know, give you those recommendations or help you understand, you know, which trees need to be taken down and which are, you know, okay to leave or whatever. Um, as far as the actual implementing, uh, you know, that's a, a bit more complicated. Um, so some things that the regional district might be able to help with could be things like on certain days having a, a community chipping day 
Um, so this is where uh, people who have um, coniferous trees that are dying or dead on their property and they want to get rid of them, um, there will be one day advertised in the paper, uh, come down to, you know, the local uh, community hall, we're, we're there with a wood chipper, just, you know, bring it in a pickup truck and we'll, we'll, we'll get rid of it for you. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, th there, I think, I think there'll be some answers in the, in the plan that uh, might be interesting to you. Um, and we'll definitely talk about how uh, homeowners can help uh, clean up their properties and, and uh, make, make them more fire smart. I guess because looking at age and physical limitations, a lot of those things aren't possible. I mean, yeah. I'm willing to, yeah. if, um, a group in the community wanted to come in that had the insurance and the expertise to take the trees down and sell the wood yeah. uh, for firewood to someone because yeah. I mean, lots of people in this area are still um, using wood lots of times because we can't, yeah. don't have natural gas here at all. We can't get it. Because yeah. I can jump in and uh, what I would recommend is reaching out to the local fire departments. Oftentimes they have a fire prevention officer that would be able to or um, knows of local fire smart representatives that can come to your home and give you an assessment. Um, so that would be my, my first suggestion was give a call to your local fire department and they will be able to provide some resources and an additional um, support for perhaps getting somebody out to um, out to your property. So that would be my first recommendation. Um, and then if you do have any other specific questions, you can drop me a line and I might be able to answer some of the more specific ones for you. Um, so yeah. Right, I did put a request into uh, the forestry department at VIU about a year and a half ago, but nobody responded to my email. I had phoned, and of course, with COVID, nobody's mm -hmm. coming out because I thought here this would be a really good project for students in the forestry program. Mm -hmm. When you got the, the kind of acreage you've got, um, the diversity with uh, property that's been farmed for years by Louis Stark in years past down to Stark's Lake and then you've got the forested area mm -hmm. and you know just the uh, different um, ecological systems on my own property so yeah absolutely feel free to reach out and I'd love to have a conversation with you about it kind of on right. on my end and um, we can always we can always chat a little bit about some of the opportunities for getting other people engaged on your property for sure. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you for the presentation. Thanks for the question, Sharon. I have more. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, no, um, well, whatever you got. First of all, is it, you're recording this. Is it going to be available to people who couldn't attend? Like, yeah. can I recommend that? people I know that are in this electoral area watch it? Yeah. You absolutely. bet. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. Caitlin, we, you we'll you go ahead, Caitlin. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be posting <laughs> um, this and also some of the questions on the Get Involved page, the Wildfire Resiliency Get Involved page. We're going to post all of them so you can say to all of your friends, and we encourage you to do so, um, we'll be posting one for each electoral area. A lot of them will be kind of similar overlapping information, but please do share it and please do encourage your friends and family to watch them because it gives them a bit more awareness of um, what we're living in and what the wildfire risks are. And uh, another question was, thanks, Caitlin. Another question was uh, about the uh, evacuation routes. Are some of those already set up and you're just evaluating those or is this all... Um, particularly fire related, like uh, Sharon was saying, there's, there's, um, there's issues like getting out of your place <laughs> and where if you end up where the fire is, what, you know, does it, you know, what does it look like right now? Like what does it evacuation look like right now? Um, I can kind of speak to how evacuations work in the regional district right now and where our plans look like. And then um, Matt, I'll get you to fill in the gaps about how you assess evacuation routes and different, um, different kind of avenues there. So right now um, we have what's called an all hazards emergency plan. And we have a set of guidelines for evacuations that we follow um, when there is a need 
um, we tend, we don't share um, specific locations of where to evacuate to, um, to residents until we know where the actual circumstance is. So for example, um, if there's a wildfire evacuation, um, we wouldn't have it preordained and we wouldn't inform the public, um, you know, months and months in advance about, oh, if there's a wildfire, go here, because we don't know where the wildfire is going to occur. And we don't know when those typical evacuation routes could be blocked or damaged or being used for um, a response vehicle. So um, we have a very specific process and policy um, in place to define where we would send people, how we would send people there. Um, we have that all pre-planned already, but when the, the actual event occurs, we go through our specific process to define exactly, okay, now we're gonna send them here. And typically we inform the public through our voyant alert system. That's our first, um, our first method of informing the public and residents who would be affected by the evacuation. Um, or displaced by the evacuation, but we will also publish um, those as a news release and uh, throughout our social media channels as well. So um, that's kind of how the process works when um, we receive an evacuation. But the evacuation route planning is a separate process that we do a lot more extensively. Um, but Matt, I'll let you kind of bring in the rear with about how you look at evacuation routes and, and different areas for the CWRP. Yeah, yeah. So, and because and as Caitlin's kind of hinting, it is a little bit different. So our our community wildfire resiliency plan is, um, it's before the event, uh, right, Susan? So we're, like, we're not thinking of a specific wildfire in a specific place. Um, when I was driving around um, your community, sort of what I'm taking notes on is, uh, does a neighborhood only have one access in and out in terms of public road? Um, because, you know, if that is true, then, you know, two, I, like picture two communities and they're both surrounded by forests, except one of them has four ways, uh, four connections to say, like the, the wider area and, and the other community only has one. So even if those forests are exactly the same, and in some sense, the risk in the community with fewer access points is going to be higher. Um, even though it you know, may not show up that way on the maps because the maps are looking just at sort of like the forest characteristics. From an emergency response perspective, um, we may want to consider directing resources for fire smart or fire preparedness toward toward the community that only has one access. Um, does, does that make sense? But we're not sort of like Caitlin is thinking, we're not thinking about like the specifics of a, of a particular event and how it would all play out. Um, yeah. Could I say something here? I think we have to look at how people are feeling. This is, I mean, I've been where I am for 40 years mm -hmm. and it's a major concern when you look at um, uh, Extension Road, the whole Chase River area, the Cinnabar area that's really treed and the only access is through um, Extension Road to the highway to the north or a White Rapids Road to the south and out to the Nanaimo River Road and out. And once you get to Cinnabar, we're in a real forest interface area and you've got people, it doesn't matter if it's a fire, it's an earthquake or whatever it is, people I think need to have some idea ahead of time is what is the route I'm supposed to take? I don't think we can leave it to the last minute. I myself, I keep, um, cell phone reception is very poor. I keep a landline, but lots of people don't have landlines or they have Shaw, your power goes out, you have no way of being contacted. And I, it's different than being in the city. And so all of these elements need to be looked at um, when you're looking at specific areas. One size does not fit all. I, mm -hmm. Anyway. It's a real concern that's been on my mind. I used to serve on the advisory planning commission when we had it them years ago. And so I'm aware of a lot of the difficulties in speaking to our regional district rep and, and neighbors and things. So mm -hmm. we need to be really cognizant of these problems. Um, anyway, I said what I've got to say about it. <laughs> 
Yeah, and Sharon, I'd be happy to kind of explore some of your thoughts a little bit further if you'd like um, offline, because I think, you know, there is a lot of value in understanding what a resident's concerns are specifically, because I don't live in your area and, and Matt doesn't live in your area. So um, I'd be happy to chat with you offline and, and kind of hear some of your concerns in a little bit more detail and, and talk about how um, we can frame our plans a little bit better. Thanks for the comment. Me again. <laughs> yeah, please, Susan. <laughs> One more thing about the buoyancy uh, alert system. Could you oh. give me some more about that? So buoyant alert is our emergency alerting system. And it is essentially, um, we publish any emergency alerts that we have on buoyant alert. And buoyant alert will then automatically send depending on how you register, because it's up to you, um, we'll send either a phone call to your phone line and it gives you an automated message saying, there is such and such an emergency here, um, here's what you have to do and here's where you go find more information. You can also set it up for emails as well as um, through text message. So it, it's kind of like a mass alerting system that sends out this alert um, to all of the notification systems that you register for. Um, but you do have to register for it. We can't just send those alerts to you automatically without your permission. Um, and I think Matt put the yes. link in the chat. Yes, awesome. I did. And that gives you a little bit more information on it. So we published two different kinds of alerts. One would be like a critical emergency alert, which is going to be a, hey, there's an immediate issue. You need to do something about it now. And we reserve those for evacuations um, almost exclusively. The other kind of an alert would be an informational alert. And what that is, is that's when it's a bit more um, uh, less threatening. It's not so critical. So one of the things that we've, we've published in recent um, in the recent weeks was a wind warning. There was a significant wind warning. Um, gusts were going to be between you know, 80 and 90 uh, kilometers per hour. And so it's a significant danger to the public, but it's not kind of imminent danger where you have to get out and, and take action right now. Um, so that's what buoyant alert is. Thank Any you, more Susan. questions? Did that, did, did that answer yeah. your question? <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, th thank you for the question, Susan. And um, if uh, either of you have any more questions, we're happy to answer them now. Um, but otherwise, you're also free to get in touch with either of us um, about anything that you heard in the presentation tonight. Um, please take a moment to take down our emails, which are showing on the slide right now, um, so that you're able to get in touch with us. And uh, yeah, um, does anyone have any more questions? Last chance. <laughs> you can also get our um, you can get our information off of that get involved page. I think well, just my information, but um, email is yeah. probably the fastest way for me to respond. But I am happy to take phone calls if you want as well. Mm -hmm. So you did um, you did do sea shelt already, Matt? Uh, yeah, is yeah. And, so uh -huh. we did um, it's in the same stage, like it's waiting to get implemented, kind of thing, or. Well, uh, no, so the, so their plan was received by their regional district board, and um, I think you can actually uh, find it on their website now. It might have been published by now. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, so that, so that process is completed. And in some ways, that project was similar to this one in that it was for a regional district, so a lot of different communities sort of um, uh, uh, contained in, in, in the planning area, um, but in some ways it was quite different. Um, so uh, it was also, I should say, uh, part of a different process. So sort of the rules um, that we use to make these plans that are provided to us by the province uh, have changed since we, we completed that plan for the Sunshine Coast uh, Regional District. Um, but if you're interested in what one of these finished products looks like, I can try to dig up the link and send it to you through uh, Caitlin um, if, if you have any interest. Um, some other communities closer by that you might be more interested in uh, that just completed C, uh, CWRPs or Community Wildfire Protection Plans, some of them are called, 
um, is Lanceville. So Lanceville just completed one. Um, and then also to the south of you, uh, North Cowichan also completed one uh, within the last two years. So uh, lots of communities around are, are kind of using this as a tool to um, get access to more provincial government funding for doing wildfire risk activities or risk, risk reduction activities. Um, and there's lots of uh, communities to learn from in terms of what we can do uh, as well. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks mm -hmm. both of you and, uh, and Sharon too. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to say, I really appreciate the emergency notification system on the phone. I've received, I guess, oh. two phone calls about flooding, you know, but probably about three months ago, but it's, uh, it is very useful. I really appreciate that. That was me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, it is one of those kind of, it's a really interesting tool. Some people don't like it because they're like, I don't care about flooding and it doesn't bother me or I'm not worried about wildfires, but it is, um, it's a good tool. So I try to, I'm, I shamelessly plug it all the time. Tell your friends, boy and alert, get out there, sign up. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, but also tell your friends that a video for this presentation will be made available on the Get Involved page. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I'll try to get it updated this week. So yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, thank you so guys. much, you guys. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night.